William, where did you live in Burkina Faso? In a village called Moctedo, which was 100 kilometers east of Ouagadougou. What was it like living in Moctedo? Well, it was a small, numbered village in the resettlement of the Volta Valley, which you've heard about before. And it had maybe 500 people. And I was the only non voltaic living in the village. And I had my little mud house, and I expanded it to two mud houses with a big courtyard surrounding the two. And I was there two and a half years. And I, I'm a natural nester. And I sort of nested and made my own life in my own little village. How old were you when you went? Yeah. I was 56 when I went. I was what was known as a senior volunteer mm -hmm. to the uh, Peace Corps, which was in name only because they didn't do anything else except call us senior volunteers. And But to the Voltaics, I was sort of like the wise old man because at age 56, I was probably one of the oldest people in the village because they don't live that long. What inspired you to go at that age? Well, I had lived in Africa before. I had visited Africa several times. And I had lived in East Africa for five years, from 1973 to 1978. And uh, I wanted to live abroad again. And the, I had worked for the Anglican Church before, and they had nothing available, so I went to the Peace Corps and I said, I would like to go and live someplace, but not Africa. And they said, well, because you have lived in Africa and proved you can, we'll send you to Africa this time, and then the next time maybe we'll send you someplace else. So I ended up in West Africa rather than East, Did which was more difficult because of language. In East Africa, you could speak English, and you were entirely dependent on French in West Africa. And you learned to speak French? And well, I had not studied French since 1946, and it was a, an effort to get by, and get by was just about all I did. Did you ever regret going? Never, never, never. I loved it. What did you love about it? I liked the way I lived. I loved, I liked live, breathing the fresh, clean air. Uh, I liked talking to simple people with no pretensions at all. Genuine, simple farmers, that's who I lived with. With an, another culture completely, another religion, I lived based in a village that was basically Muslim. I mean, but I was adopted by the local Roman Catholic Church as their, as their resident Anglican, which was a whole story in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I was taken to bush masses on the back of a motorcycle. I was, I was treated like royalty. I always sat on the front log. The front log. <laughs> I mean, when you weren't seats, it was all logs, and I was always on the front log. <laughs> because I was, the, I was the honored guest. Uh, that's great. What did you do in Mock Data? What was your job? I did the same thing as Leslie. We, we were small business advisors. We made loans oh, to set up bicycle shops for grain banks, for Boutiques. I mean, a big loan to us was the equivalent of five hundred dollars. I mean, and we were making little capitalists out of all these peasants. It didn't work too well most of the time, but I mean, we tried. But mainly, it was the contact with the people. We had a what was called the chef de bloc, which was a block of villages, and I lived in the same village. Well, he was a Muslim, with who lived with his two wives and his five children. And uh, his two wives didn't see awfully much of him while I was there because he came over at sundown every night and by kerosene lamp, we sat there and played cards. 
every night and drank beer or dolo, but mostly beer. I mean, dolo was not really for me. But uh, there was a, a good relationship between the chef de bloc and myself, and, and I taught him American cards, which we played in French. And nobody would ever believe how that was sort of a, a common denominator between uh, Ali and myself. And one thing I remember particularly is that when I left the village after two years, Ali was traveling and was not there. And his two wives, who spoke not a word of French, not a word of English, only Moray, and they lived about a half a mile from where I lived. They knew I was leaving the next morning. They got, they scrubbed and polished all of the kids and themselves, put their best clothes on and walk the half mile just to say goodbye to me. And goodbye was all body language. I mean, they, I couldn't understand what they were saying. They couldn't understand. And this whole ceremony took about 15 minutes, which was, it almost had all of us in tears. <laughs> but that is sort of a sample of what, what, what these people were like. Mm -hmm. Nali was a fortunate person because his two wives liked one another. It, it's, for a Muslim, it's, it's, it's not too good when your wives don't get along, <laughs> as, far, as far as I understand. <laughs> what, would, um, what would a typical day in your life be like, living in that day? Well, in the hot season, a day would be getting up as the sun got up and trying to do some work before it got too hot and work breakfast in there somewhere. And then by 10 o'clock, you just did absolutely nothing until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You, it was too hot, you couldn't, you couldn't move, because you were living in 110 degree heat under a tin roof. My house actually got so hot in the hot season is that I had some raw potatoes sitting on a table and they baked in my house. <laughs> they literally baked sitting on a table. It, it, that is hot. I could, I could use my typewriter, which I had brought with me, because you could do this. But I couldn't write anything on a piece of paper because it would be smeared from the perspiration on, on a pad of paper. So you would uh, just uh, sit in the shade and try not to move during the hot day? During the, from about 10 in the morning till about 3 in the afternoon. You just were very careful. You didn't, you didn't make excess motion because it was that hot. And but I had lived in hot Africa before and it didn't bother me as much as it did some people. Nothing bothered me as, as much as it did some people because I had been all through this in a different form before. What, all right, th that's your day. What was Ali's day like? He went around visiting different villages in his block. Sometimes I went with him, when, and he did the same thing early in the morning and late in the afternoon. Nobody did anything. The only people who did anything were the, were the, were the, the farmers, as, as one somebody had said before. They're, their plots of farms. Sometimes they would walk an hour, an hour and 15 minutes to even get to the part that they farmed, which I thought was, they, they would literally leave at four in the morning so that they could arrive at their fields at daylight and stay there until dark because the farming season was, was so short. And then the rest of the time, I mean, they, they had nothing to do. And their main crop was, their cash crop was cotton by the French cartel, and then they did sorghum and millet and some maize. But uh, the cotton was the most important. And this again was in the Volta Valley where that Tom had talked about, uh, where the bush was resettled. This is the, another stage after he was there. Where this is the actual resettlement of this valley on, on the Volta Blanche. 
Tell me a little bit about the businesses that you were you were funding, the small enterprises. And the oh, these these little boutiques that would sell just the absolute basics like matches, kerosene, beer, soft drinks, maybe spaghetti, because they were. We were about 12 miles from the nearest what we would call town, Moctado, which I went to maybe once a week or twice a week. But some of those people could, I mean, if you're going to the fields every morning at four, at four o'clock in the morning, you, you just don't get to market in, in the farming season. I mean, you cannot take the time. One, one interesting story was the priest, Father Cosmas, who had adopted me, uh, he knew of two widows, and a wid the position in Voltaic society, or Burkina Bay society, what have you, uh, the position of a widow is just nothing. I mean, the position of women is not much, but a widow, it's, it's, they're, they're, in that society, a woman's life is considered over if her husband dies. And this man, he was Catholic, but he had had two wives. He was still an animist, and the church there did not make them get rid of a wife. Well, the husband died. These two women had, I think, seven children between the two of them. And instead of just vegetating, they went out, took some unoccupied fields, and with the, the seven children, those two women farmed on their own. They were the poorest of the poor, but these children were the most delightful children I had ever met in my life. And uh, since when I was introduced to them, I found the way to get through the maize field to get to them, and I would bring them nothing luxurious, because, but they couldn't even get to the market unless they walked. So I'd bring them simple things like salt, or bread, which was a luxury, or soap, things that they would need and could not make for themselves. And the kids would hear my motorcycle coming. They'd come running out of the fields, these little kids in, you talk about rags. I mean, they were, they were the raggedest kids you've ever seen, but beautiful kids. I loved them all. And I was there sort of, they didn't know what to think of this great old white face that came to visit them once in a while, but they, they loved it. <laughs> I think probably one of my clearest memories is uh, are the Bigas, the, the kids everywhere. And they're just always there. Mischief and curiosity and just really bright. Faces. Well, since I left there, I found out that one of the two women died. And that the one who was left, the one widow left, she took all seven children and she's still doing the same thing with them.